we're in this last part of the series we're doing on one another, which is all about what it takes to create healthy relationships. And the way that the New Testament describes healthy, God-honoring relationships is by telling us we should be doing certain things to one another. And so Pastor Simon told us that there's 59 unique examples of those one another statements used throughout the New Testament, 59 times that we're given a specific command to carry something out. So, for example, we're told to love, encourage, serve, and forgive one another. And today, for the last part of this series, we're adding one more to that list, which is live in harmony with one another, which comes from Romans 12, 16. And together, these give us a really important in insight into what God expects from us in our relationships with other people. And I said this last time, but if everyone practiced these all the time, you'd think that you'd died and gone to heaven. And that's exactly their purpose. Their purpose is to allow us to experience what it would be like when heaven and earth overlap. Their purpose is to create the kinds of relationships and communities that you'd expect in God's presence. But the problem is that, for now, we live in a, a broken world, right? And those good relationships, those God-honoring relationships, they're hard to maintain. And a quote here that I have um, from Simon Smart for the Centre for Public Christianity, I think he puts it nicely, so I've got it here. It says, the problem is true community is costly. It's hard work and inconvenient and involves time, selflessness and care for people we might otherwise choose not to be around. It's where we learn patience and kindness and humility and hospitality. It's where we can be a support to others while they support us. All right, so building those healthy relationships or living in true community, as he puts it there, actually comes with lots of benefits. Right? We can be a support to others while they support us. And as we've seen over the, the course of this series, there's a lot of benefits there we can't afford to live without that love that we get, the encouragement that we get from other people is essential to our community. But at the same time, it's costly. Right? Loving, encouraging, serving, forgiving one another is hard work. And it takes time, effort, it's going to cost you some resources. And living in harmony with other people is no different. Right? Especially if it's with a diverse group of people. People who are not like ourselves. And if living in harmony were easy, then things like Harmony Week, for example, wouldn't exist. And you might have heard of Harmony Week. It's a, actually a government initiative that began back in 1999. And it's all about celebrating the diversity of people that make up Australia. And it's designed to encourage people to be inclusive and show respect to one another. And so the need for initiatives like Harmony Day comes from the fact that Australia is an incredibly diverse place to live. And so some interesting stats here from the ABS, from their, their census data in, in 2021, up on the screen there, they say that just over half of Australians were born overseas or have at least one parent who was. All right, so there's an, there's an incredible diversity in the backgrounds that people have. Around 44% of Australians identify as being Christian, uh, with the next largest group being those of no religious affiliation, followed by all the other major faiths. And so there's incredible diversity in belief. And there's 167 Indigenous languages that are spoken in Australia. There's incredible diversity within certain groups of people, within Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as well. And so together, those give you a very um, brief overview of the kind of diversity that exists within this country. So it might not come as a surprise then that living in harmony is not always easy. With diversity of people comes diversity in thought, culture and beliefs. Right? And it's normal to sometimes find those differences in the way people live or what they believe uh, confronting or uncomfortable. And unfortunately, history has shown us that the easy way out has to be respond, has been responding to those things with intolerance or even oppression and violence. But in contrast to that, Jesus teaches us not to take the easy road. Instead, he encourages us to live a life of harmony despite the cost. And that's what we're going to explore today by looking at Romans 12, because in that we get this clear picture of what it takes to live in harmony and what it looks like in the biblical sense. And so if you'd like to read along with me, I'll be looking at Romans chapter 12. And we're going to start 
in verse 16, which is the verse that underpins this sermon for today. And so Paul's letter to the church in Rome says this in verse 16. Romans 12, 16. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And don't think you know it all. So harmony happens when the parts of something are combined into a pleasing arrangement. That's a, a dictionary definition. It's a, a pleasing combination of different parts. And Paul is saying the way we should live should be a harmony. Right? Our lives should come together in a pleasing arrangement. And straight away, Paul gives us one of the requirements of living in harmony. It's humility. He says to live in harmony requires humility from everyone involved. He says, don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. He's saying don't be arrogant, you know, thinking that you're too good to be around other people, too good to hang out with other people, too good to work with other people. Those are, um, you know, those people that you might think are ordinary or even lowly, they are actually intended to be part of this harmony that God is creating. And so this raises some questions for us. If a if harmony is this pleasing combination of different parts, what is pleasing in God's eyes? And what does harmony look like in Christian community? And so Paul gives us a fantastic metaphor for what this looks like in the same chapter. So in verses 4 to 5, it says this, Just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body, what she means the church community. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. So what Paul is saying here, that if you, if you want to know what community is supposed to look like, you don't have to look any further than your own body. He says your body is this metaphor for healthy community, for healthy relationships, and it's a picture of harmony. Right? So he says we are many parts of one body, and we all know that the body has many parts. Right? There's over 300 organs in the human body that serve some sort of unique function. There's this huge diversity in both form and function for all those different parts, from you know, your heart to your brain, your hands to your eyes. Each of those performs some sort of unique and important function that helps the body come together and function at its best. And Paul is saying that it's the same for our communities and relationships. Our community is meant to be this gathering of people with different skills, different backgrounds, different life experiences, the many parts speaks of diversity amongst its people. And this diversity is required because we don't all fill the same function. Right? Each part has a special function, as Paul puts it there. Each person is required because each person has something unique to bring. There are skills that you can bring, experiences that you can share, people that you can reach that perhaps no one else can. And so diversity is part of what is required for harmony. That's really important. Diversity is required. And that's important to realise because I think harmony can sometimes be mistaken for homogeneity. You know, the idea that everything needs to be the same in order to function correctly or just to get along together. But if we think of what it means to harmonise in the, the musical sense, for example, it's about each person adjusting their pitch, not to perfectly match everyone else, but to complement the others so that it makes a pleasant sound. And they each contribute something different, but complementary to each other. And it's the same with the body. That's the point Paul is getting at here. Each part contributes something and complements the others. So the body functions at its best when those many parts are all working together. Which is why Paul also says that our communities should be one body. And so the human body, it's made up of these many parts, but it's still just one thing, right? It's one organism, one body. In the same way, our community, although it's made up with lots of different people, it should be one. And this speaks of unity amongst the people in this community. And at the time Paul is writing this, things like being a Jew or a Gentile, slave or free, they were social or cultural statuses that would divide people. You know, Jews wouldn't associate with Gentiles, slaves were considered to be of little or no worth compared to people who were free. And so there's, uh, yeah, this divide between people. And Paul is saying here that those cultural 
of social things that tend to divide people in the world have no place in the church. And one of the reasons Christianity attracted so many followers in the first century was that women, slaves, people who were of low social standing at the time, they were welcome to come and follow Jesus, right? In fact, they were seen as being a necessary part of the community. And the result was that people who would never associate anywhere else in Roman culture came together in relationship with one another in the church. And for us today, those things that have the power to divide people are probably not so different. They are things like ethnic background, gender, I think especially today political affiliations. They all have the power to divide us in some way. But if the church is one body, then those things don't divide you here. And so unity is required for harmony to exist. And of course, that unity comes from Jesus, from who he is and what he's done for us. Because of Jesus, we're, we're more than just this loosely related group of people. We're more than just a social club. When we made that decision to follow Jesus, we became brothers and sisters. You know, and our com- community is like that. It's like a family. And our, our common allegiance to Jesus is what draws us together. And because of our commitment to him, we are by extension committed to each other. Which really speaks to the last part of that verse there, you know, where many parts of one body, but we all belong to each other. Paul says we all belong to each other. And he's saying there that there's this level of mutual submission to each other and even a desire to serve each other that's actually required to bring about harmony. And so this shows us what harmony looks like in community. Those things come together to give us a really, uh, I think, descriptive picture of what it looks like. It looks like a diverse group of people coming together in Jesus' name and serving each other, you know, sharing their unique gifts, sharing their talents to lift each other up. And so that's what is pleasing in God's eyes. That's the, that's the harmony. It's that, that pleasing combination of parts. And so this idea that we can live in harmony, I think, is easier for us to accept in church communities because we do have that ultimate unifier, Jesus, right? The one who renews our minds, you know, changes us into a family. And that metaphor that Paul is using there, he, he is describing church communities. And so you could ask, what about our relationships with people outside of our church community? Is it possible to live in, in harmony with people who don't know Jesus? And the way Paul puts it is like this. In the same chapter, verse 18, he says, do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. And so Paul describes here, very simply, a quality that should define our relationships with all people. It's peace. And doing all that you can to live in peace implies that we would be tolerant of people who hold vastly different views to our own. And tolerance, should be clear, it doesn't mean agreement, right? This isn't about accepting other people's points of view as being valid. Tolerance in the biblical sense is about treating people with compassion and respect, even though you might deeply disagree with them. And so tolerance, I think, means that we can be honest about those differences, the differences that we have with other people's beliefs, and at the same time, resolve to never allow those differences to divide us, right? to lead to discrimination, oppression, or violence. You know, instead, we do all that we can to live in peace. And being tolerant of others' beliefs means that we, we do act to preserve their rights. We work with others for a common good. We even make friends with people who are not part of our immediate church community. Those things are important. But in this case, we are missing that thing that unifies us in the church, right? We're we're, we're missing that shared allegiance to Jesus. But God still expects us to love those people sincerely, right? Because God loves those people. And the thing that unites us in this case is simply our shared humanity. And this has a powerful effect, right? The, The benefit here comes from taking a step back and looking at the bigger picture, I think, because... What this does is it, is it opens a space for you to have a conversation with people who are not part of your church community. There's, 
an opportunity for dialogue between people who might otherwise not associate with each other. And it creates this opportunity for others to see what harmony looks like as part of your church community. And that's so powerful. This is not just a, a peaceful existence. This is, this is real harmony, right? The, the coming together of many parts in that pleasing arrangement. And that's really what this is about. You know, it's about demonstrating the gospel message and communicating to people the truth about who Jesus is and what he's done to us. And one of the ways that you can do that is by simply showing people the harmony that exists in your community, within the church, and the healthy relationships that we really try to foster here. Because with that, we overcome the brokenness of our world. And Paul concludes this chapter in Romans by saying this. He says, don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. Conquer evil by doing good. You could say conquer evil by living in harmony. You know, conquer evil by living in this diverse, unified community of Jesus' followers who live in peace and extend tolerance to the people around them. You know, Christianity in the first century, at the time Paul is writing this, this letter, turned the world upside down by living in harmony with other people in this way. And it was, and I think still is, something that the world struggles to achieve. And that's one of those things that people should look at our church communities and see something that's so profoundly different as harmony. And so what I would hope that you'd take from this message today is a, a fresh idea of what harmony looks like. Harmony is this pleasing combination of different parts. And in the biblical sense, it looks like a diverse group of people united by Jesus who serve each other. All right, there's a, a powerful example there in those many parts that Paul speaks about, the many parts being the diversity of the people who make up this church, diversity in their, their backgrounds, their skills, their life experiences coming together into one place, and that one body being the unity that exists here, a people unified in their allegiance to Jesus, everyone coming under the leadership of the one true king of the world, and recognising who he is and what he's done for us personally. There's a lot of power in that. So I hope you would take that message today, that Harmony is this diverse group of people unified by Jesus who serve each other. And personally, what does this mean for you? I think if we're to really live this out, to live in harmony with one another, as Paul is instructing us there, it's going to require you to develop some qualities that foster those healthy relationships. And one of those qualities that Paul highlights in association with this verse particularly is humility. Right? He's saying that there's room here to address your own biases and prejudices. And so I would, would encourage you to seek some time of personal reflection on this. We, we all have prejudices. We all have our own biases about other people. It is, I think, just human nature to develop those based on people's ethnicity, their political affiliations, their religion, whatever it might be, we tend to put people in boxes, don't we? That is human nature. And so I would encourage you to pray about this, to seek God and reflect on what those might be for you personally. And ask God help to help you working through those, that you would be able to come to a place where you can extend peace and tolerance to people who hold vastly different worldviews to your own and to even come to a place where you would love them. And the other part of this, I think, that gets highlighted in Paul's analogy of a body is the idea that if we're to live in harmony with one another, it's going to require you to develop an attitude of service that's absolutely essential for this harmony to exist. So this is, this is a call for you to serve others this morning. This is a call for you to bring your unique gifts, your unique talents, your unique background and life experience to this community here. It's essential, actually. If the community is missing part of your contribution, the harmony isn't complete, you could say. And so those two things to reflect on this morning for you personally, I'd say, is humility and service. And if you're looking for ways to serve, absolutely come and have a chat to me about it. There's always room to serve in this place. And so as we reflect on those things where we can personally 
change and improve, I just say, remember that it does come with a cost. You know, Paul is very upfront about the cost this will take on people in Romans chapter 12. There will be a cost to your time. It will cost effort, resources to make this come about. But this is also time for us to take a step back and look at the, the bigger picture and the greater benefit that this cost brings with it. God is asking you to be part of this harmony because with it, you'll conquer evil by doing good. You'll show people what it looks like when heaven comes to earth. And you'll experience, I believe, peace and joy that comes with that as well. Let's pray. Dear Lord, yes, thank you so much for this time this morning. I thank you, Lord, for helping us to understand what it means to live in community with each other and build those healthy relationships. I pray, Lord, that as we reflect on this series as a whole, that you would help us to love one another, to serve one another, encourage one another, Lord, and come together in unity and harmony. Lord, I just pray that as we reflect on what it is that makes communities like ours a picture of harmony, that, that you would really work through us to be unified under your leadership, Lord, that we would be reminded that you are the one true unifier, the one that will eventually unite all people under you, Lord. And so we ask, Lord, that you would help renew our minds, that you would help us to be humble, help us to confront our own biases and prejudices and come to a place, Lord, where we, where we can extend tolerance and peace to those who are vastly different to ourselves, Lord, that you would help us to love those people. And within this church community, Lord, I pray that we would become that picture of harmony, that people would see something profoundly different about our gatherings and that they would see you in it, Lord, that ultimately the gospel message would be communicated to them through the harmony that exists in this place, in your church. Amen.